Good afternoon, guys. Thanks for joining us today for the last session in this year's masterclass series on succession planning, but a very important one around the value of your real estate and how you use your real estate in your succession plan. It's often thought of just as the place that the business sits, but it's actually much more important and valuable than that and can be used in some really creative ways. So thanks for being here. You can pick up any of the former sessions from this year on our website at hingebrokers.com. But I think most of you guys are uh, repeat um, participants, so we appreciate that and you probably know that already. Quick reminder that we will do about 40, 45 minutes of content and then we would love your questions. If you hover over the top of your screen, you should have a panel bar with a Q&A icon. So feel free to put your questions there as we go. And we'll give you, of course, a little bit of time at the end to ask others. So let's dive in. Um, what your real estate's worth is a little bit of a complicated process, but I'm gonna try to break it down into some simple steps. And what I'd like for you to be mindful of as we talk about this, let's get familiar, the main thing, because I know we have people in very different places in their um, real estate knowledge and experience, and that's okay. Maybe you have never owned a piece of real estate and you're thinking about it. Maybe you have uh, built your real estate or you lease it. Uh, maybe you want to do it in the future and you're trying to figure out whether you should do that versus lease. So there are a lot of different places, but what I like, the main takeaway is concepts and terminology. So if you guys leave this session today and you get the overall concept and you start to recognize some of the terminology because it's not complicated terminology, it's just stuff that, you know, real estate people say to make themselves sound smarter. So we'll break down, that down and make it simple. So those are our two main objectives today. If we don't answer everything or you have specific needs or want to look specifically at your real estate or real estate strategies, I or one of our broker team are always happy to talk to you about that. So first of all, um, before we get right into the content, we've got a couple of... Um, let me tell you about the agenda. Oops. Okay, first of all, what are we gonna do today? I wanna tell you about a couple of things going on at Hinge, a couple of opportunities that you might wanna take advantage of. We'll get into the content of our real estate and theory. We'll talk about terminology, like I said, and then we're gonna break it down and do a case study. So we'll look at a hypothetical school and how we figure out what their real estate's worth. And then what's happening next? So there's our hour. First of all, um, in our Hinge news, we have our annual business and financial conference coming up in February in Miami Beach. I can't tell you how excited I am about this year's content. It is so fantastic. And I'm so grateful for the number of people who have come to me and asked to speak or said, we think this is important for business owners to hear. Can you do a session around this? So um, I'll just give you a couple of highlights. I will also say that we um, limit this event to 300 and we're in the 200s. I don't know where we are, but low 200s right now. And I don't want you guys to miss it. So we try to keep it small. We do want you to make very meaningful con um, contacts with people. So we're not trying to go huge, or we're just trying to get a real powerful group in there. This year, we have two keynote speakers. Greg McEwen is the author of the book, Essentialism. It's been my favorite book of the year. So all of our content for next year, I hope he doesn't mind me borrowing this, for our master classes and in some of our workshops will be around the essential elements of how to run your business. So really excited to have him. If you don't have that book, grab it. We will have a book signing for him there, so you can get it there and have him sign it. We are excited that our second keynote speaker is Joe Kirshner, the CEO at Primrose. Um, we have not heard from the 
franchise community. So we're very happy that Joe agreed to come and speak with us about franchising and the benefits and the challenges that are associated with that. I can't even tell you about our five shifters because each one of them could take 15 minutes here. They are fantastic people doing incredible things in the industry, lots of high powered ideas. Um, and then I'm just in the process of completing the breakout sessions. And um, it's just, it's an action packed two and a half days. And besides that, if you haven't been with us before, we have fun. We're not going to have an event if we don't have fun. So we do try to treat our guests really well and have a good time and relax. And so we hope that you guys can join us there. There we go. Well, it would have been nice to see their photos. So there's Greg McEwen and there's Joe Kirshner and there are keynotes this year. So we're excited. Um, I will be presenting next week a webinar for AELL. So excited about that. I did a couple of speaking engagements this year on the most important five elements to, to help you be financially healthy. So that's next Wednesday at one. If you're a member at AELL plug-in, I'm guessing you can plug in as well if you're not a member, but if you have any trouble getting um, connected with that, let me know. We'd love to see you there. And then let's just get into this about what your school's real estate is worth. So the first thing that I want to throw at you guys, because it's a common confusion with people when they want to know what their real estate's worth and they're trying to plan a strategy to grow or to sell. And it's a common conversation that my real estate appraised for blank 10 years ago, two years ago, last year. So they're different if you've owned real estate before, and this um, is commercial real estate that has a business housed in it, you know that several different approaches are taken when the value of the real estate is determined. And the two main approaches are, what is the underlying real estate worth as compared to other businesses and real estate in the area. And that's where you get into sales and comps of other things that have been sold. So that just tells you what the buildings were. If it was a building that could do anything, that's what it's worth. The second one is the income approach. And that one says, if there's a business in that building that creates the funds to support the expenses of that building, then what is, can that building be worth? What could it be bought and sold for? And that's what we're working with when we're working with you guys, because generally you don't have an empty building. If you do have an empty building, we're talking to you completely differently than we are if you're building houses, a business in it. So it's the business and the potential revenue and cash flow of the business determines the real estate value. And I know that's contrary to what a lot of people, how they think and what they've been taught, but it makes it even more critical that your business be financially healthy, that your tuition rates are where they need to be. All the things I preach about, that your discounts are healthy, that your expense control is, um, you know, you're creating a, a beautiful environment for children, but you're good stewards of the money that you have and you're not wasting money. So it, it makes it twofold important um, from a value standpoint to have a thriving business because that determines the value of your business, but it also determines the value of your real estate. So a little bit different mindset. So let's work from there and let's talk about the metrics that determine um, what your real estate's worth with the business in it. But first of all, let's fly up 10,000 feet and talk about options for your real estate. So there is a much more in-depth masterclass on our website about options for you when you are thinking about your real estate. But this is just a quick summary to be sure we're all in the same place. So one thing that is another mind shift for people at times is that their business and their real estate are two completely different assets. They can be um, handled completely separately. They can be bought separately. They can be sold separately or together. 
So there are two different assets that interact with each other and play off of each other, but um, can be managed separately. So I meant to say first thing, apologies for this, you know, whatever's in my head. So um, you'll see me do this occasionally. Um, okay, so broad options for your real estate. If you own your real estate, and uh, maybe you lease it, but this is talking about ownership of real estate, you could, if you have a business and a piece of real estate, you could sell that piece of real estate and keep the business. And what you do with that money, lots of options. Maybe you go on vacation, maybe you just have fun, maybe you roll it into another property and you use it as a growth asset. So we very frequently help our clients move existing real estate and then flip that into new construction or a second site or a fifth site or wherever you are in your world. So it can be used as a way to grow. It can also be used as a way to pull some money off the table and now you're leasing your property from someone else. Second option is to say, and, and frankly, when we're in the beginning of a process with most of our clients, their first thought is, eh, I'm out of here. You know, don't talk to me about keeping my real estate when I sell and, and go home. I uh, want it all gone. And so you can sell them both uh, together. You could sell them to an individual. You could sell them to a national or large regional group, like um, is our model at Hinge, and will be the basics of what I'll talk about. But you can sell them both at one time. The third thing that you could do, and I'm a fan of this, but it takes some trust and faith, and, and we um, counsel our clients differently depending on who it is that's buying their business, but maybe you uh, decide you don't want to do the day-to-day -day anymore. It's getting tougher and tougher, right? <coughs> but also, you don't know what you're going to do with the funds from your real estate, and you prefer not to give a third of it or whatever the number is today to the government. So if you have a very secure tenant, maybe you keep it and lease it to that person. So the way that I make recommendations to people is based on the risk of that new operator. Obviously, if you have an, an individual who's never been in the business before, hasn't proven themselves, I'd say, do the get me out of here, take it all, and would not sell my business unless they also bought the real estate because the last thing you want to do is get your real estate back empty and have to go back into business. If you've got a um, maybe a person that has schools already or it's a multi-site group in your city or it's a national group, if you're a good target for them, I really love you keeping your real estate. And I used to say it was a lot easier to go to the mailbox and get the rent check than to operate the business, but you don't do that anymore. You just open your bank account if you do that. And it goes in the bank. And if you have a mortgage, the mortgage gets drafted out and you're at the beach. So really a big fan of that. But again, this strategy works only when you have a very secure tenant in your building. <coughs> so what's happening in the world today? Is this a good time to consider options for your real estate? Okay, so you guys have heard me saying this for several years. I'll just talk in general that in, so I'm in my 34th year in the industry, 16th year with Hinge. And for the last three or four years, I've consistently said every year, we've never seen more interest, more aggression, and higher values being paid for early education businesses and real estate. And that just continues. So that's the summary, and let's break this down. Again, much aggression from both individuals who like real estate, and why is that? So let's talk about that for just a second. Um, when I say to our clients, you guys are the darling, one of the darlings of the investment world, they typically give me a look. But if you think about it, investors like businesses that perform consistently. They love the tech industry 15, 20 years ago. That started having way too many highs and lows. About that time, um, retail became not a great investment. Thank you, Amazons of the world. 
but childcare transactions performed really well. So when the investment community sees that there are very little dips, there are dips when we have economic fluctuations, you guys know that, but not to the extent some other industries have. So they like the consistency and feel like it's a very secure investment. So at Hinge, we don't generally um, insert individual buyers. So most of my conversation from here will be to tell you guys how the institutional buyers are behaving today. So by institutional buyers, I mean large organizations that buy real estate. So um, our buyer base is a business base that buys uh, schools that look a certain way. They want them to be a little larger and a little more profitable. Um, so generally our business buyers would be looking for businesses that were licensed for over 100 and had at least 100,000 on the bottom line. So that's kind of the minimum threshold for institutional buyers. If you're smaller than that, not a problem, not anything wrong with your business, it's just generally a better fit for an individual. You can at times get better value from an individual. It's a little more work to go through the process because generally that person has to get financing. They need to um, create documents and they're less, less experienced. When you get to the stage where you're a target for an institutional buyer, those guys are paying you cash. They have processes and people that make it really easy to go through. So I'll talk to that respect. So from the institutional buyers, here are a couple of general rules of thumb. We get questioned a lot about, I have three or four schools. What if I sold four of them to an institutional buyer? And I'm talking about real estate only now. Can I get more money for that? Not generally. So it's the complete opposite with business assets. <laughs> with business assets, the more schools you have, the higher the number would be. With real estate, in general, not. <coughs> Maybe a little tweak, but not enough to be noteworthy. So again, some, <coughs> some people think there's strength in numbers there. Generally not when we're talking about real estate. With institutional buyers, I mentioned some of these, they're usually fast to close and easy. They're flexible with their legal documents and have documents already that have been used many times. We're gonna talk about some of this um, terminology, so I'm just gonna throw the first bit at you and we're gonna move to the next screen and I'll explain in more detail, but start us thinking about some of the terminology. So for companies that have one school or have small groups, they are averaging today a seven and three quarter cap rate, capitalization rate, which I will further explain, with companies wanting them to have a two to three times cash flow coverage. What that means is they want the rent, I'm sorry, they want the cash flow after the rent to be two to three times the rent. So let's say the rent is $100,000 a year, that means your bottom line after the rent needs to be two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars. So two to three times the rent. So we'll do that a couple more times. Okay, so let's talk about where we start. <coughs> Again, I'm talking about a piece of real estate that has an operating business in it that drives the value of that real estate. And if you to further explain that. If an investor is thinking about an empty building and they want to invest in that empty building, they're gonna go look for a tenant and they wanna know what the market rate is and they're gonna bring in the tenant that's willing to pay that market rate. If your business is already in that building, there's a limit to what that business can make in that building. So there's a finite capacity there's a current tuition rate. Maybe you could increase your tuition every year, but in this environment, your expenses are going up just as much. So <coughs> there's a pretty finite amount of money you can make when you're 100% full, or our benchmark is 70% full to try to set a benchmark. So that's the theory. The rent and the real estate value are determined by what the business can produce. Again, logically, 
this business has to be able to pay the rent. And we need to figure out what is a healthy amount of rent that business can pay and still thrive. So when I talk about the five essential elements of financial health, and I just mentioned that webinar I'm doing next week for AELL, it's also the basis of our Thrive workshops and a lot of the content we do. Because I want you guys to not get overwhelmed with 99 things to think about. I want you to cover the big five and they get you 99% of the way there. So the fifth one in my list is to be sure that your rent or mortgage payment is set at a healthy level <coughs> for you to make the cash flow you need to reinvest in your company and your teachers and your people and yourself, which is you can't thrive until you do that. So the rent and the real estate are determined by what the business can produce. So here's the calculation. Step one, we wanna determine a market rent. You own your business, you own your building, and we wanna know what that real estate is worth with your business in it. So the first thing we want to do is we've got a few benchmarks that are pretty commonly accepted in our industry by investors. Now there's always outliers. So take this as a um, down the middle um, calculation, knowing that the Californias and the New Yorks of the world need to call us because you're different. And more rural markets, need to call us because you can behave differently as well. But the average company is a great benchmark for you. And then if you're outside that benchmark, it's okay, just understand why and be sure you can still thrive in your individual situation. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that we do is we determine what the business would earn if it was 70% full, offline revenue. What would it earn if it was 70% full? Think about this logically. I want you to be able to pay a healthy rent at 70% occupancy. So if you're under 70%, it's going to be a struggle always. And in our, our opinion, you reach minimum financially healthy level when you get 70% full. So I want you to break even at 50%. I want you to be financially healthy at 70%. And every tuition you earn over that is practically gravy, practically goes to the bottom line. So now your, your fixed costs are covered, your teachers are in the room, maybe you have more supplies and food, you might even have to hire another part-time person or an assistant teacher. Otherwise, almost every tuition dollar goes to the bottom line. So I want you to be healthy and spend the right of money on your real estate when you're 70% full. I'll give you a quick calculation for that on the next slide. Then what we're gonna do after we take that number, we want you to pay a certain percent of that for either your rent or your mortgage. So if you own your own company, typically people will hold their real estate and their business in two separate entities and pay themselves rent. It doesn't really matter how much you pay yourself, ask your accountant which way you're, you're better off. But to be financially healthy, the actual expense needs to be in the 8 to 18% range. So 8 is incredibly low, and 18% is a very high-end market. Does it creep to 19 at times? Yeah, but I get uncomfortable. I'll just be honest. Um, <clears throat> what determines that range? So many factors. So we really have to drill down into the actual real estate. Real real estate itself. How old is the building? Is it a building that was designed for this use and functional? Is it in good condition? And have you kept it going? You guys hear me very preachy the last couple of years about rebranding and reconditioning your building every 10 to 15 years because there is so much new development going on among the franchise groups and the national groups, new players in the industry, that you really have to keep your real estate relevant and very modern. And you have to do this regularly. And it's a considerable investment. If you own the building and you um, don't have the funds, consider going back to the bank and saying, 
can I increase my mortgage $150,000? I want to make an investment in my building. If you lease your building, <clears throat> ask your landlord to do that. So I own three pieces of real estate that I leased to childcare groups that I've just invested in over the years. And I've had them for a long time. But a couple of years ago, they came to me about one of the buildings and said, we want, I think the number was 150,000. We want to improve the building. We want to do new floors and we want to rebrand and we want um, to put a new playground in. And it increases the value of your building. We'll pay you more rent will you invest that money? Well, I just went to the bank and said, will you add this to my mortgage? And they said, sure. And now I can cover it because the rent went up. So if you have a landlord or you own your building, you want that building to stay at the top of its game. You don't want to be left behind if brand new comes into your market. So I can get a little preachy about that. That might be another masterclass. So we want to set that rent Typically, we can use we can narrow that down further to 12 to 15 percent, and I would say that 80, 90 percent of schools across the country are in that 12 to 15 percent range. Uh, very high end markets might go to 18 or 19. Older buildings and more rural markets could go as low as six to eight, um, but a little more unusual. Okay, so now we know the rent. I'm going to give you the theory of how that rent then determines the value of the building. So let's think about this logically again. The rent is the return that the investor will get once they pay for that building. So if you put your money in the stock market or an investment account, you want to earn a certain percent return on your money. So a real estate investor wants to buy a building and know what rate of return they expect and then back into what they can pay for the real estate based on the amount of rent that it can pay. So we're a little bit backwards here. A lot of people think the real estate's worth this and now let's figure out the rent. You can do it that way and then you can decide if the rent's still financially healthy. But generally, we know what we want the rent to be. We're operating, or you're operating the business, and we're advising you. And then we can back into what an investor can pay for that building, knowing that's the rent they're going to get or their return on investment. Okay, don't panic. We're going to do an example of that. So, what rate of return does an investor want? Um, generally, it's going to be somewhere in the six to 10% range today. You guys heard me in the very beginning say that institutional bear, um, investors want about a seven and three quarter return individuals. So as the return goes down and they're willing to get less of a return, they can pay you more money for your real estate. So the lower the capitalization rate or capitalization rate means rate of return that they're willing to accept, the lower the cap rate, the higher the value of your real estate. So, so think about that a little backwards. So what we do, and again, we're gonna do an example. So listen and don't panic and we'll, we'll do it in just a second. Now that we've determined the rent, we're gonna take that rent, we're gonna divide it by cap rate that will determine the real estate value bear with me let's do it okay so um i said this uh, market cap rates the national groups are getting um returns or cap rates right now in the low sevens to eight range within the investment community the institutional investment community Here's another piece of terminology. Those are generally called REITs, R-E-I-T, which is a real estate investment trust. And a real estate investment trust takes wealthy individuals' money and they invest it, but only in real estate. So they're not trying to buy it and then flip it for a higher value. They just wanna buy it, own it, and that's their investment. We work with seven different ones in the US right now that. Um, love our industry, and we have gotten some fabulous results for some of our clients. But that's about the range that the larger companies are getting right now. 
we're seeing people with individual schools that are really nice, or they might have a small group of schools getting cap rates in the seven and three quarter range. So what that says again, as the investor in the real estate expects somewhere between a 7.3% and 8% return on their money after they buy the real estate. So just a theory, let me tell, show you how it works. All right, here's our case study. <coughs> Excuse me. So the first thing we want to do is we want to figure out the rent. So we do that by step one. What would this business be making if it was 70% full? Step two, apply the rent percent based on all the factors you heard me say, age, conditions, city. And then the third is to divide by the cap rate. All right, back to number one. Compute the revenue at 70% occupancy. There are a lot of different ways to do this, but this is the hinge down and dirty way. And I'll, I'll tell you why I like it this way over other methods. I want you to very simply take your license capacity. I get a question a lot about, yeah, we could have 200, but we would only put 150 in there. Yeah, okay, but you could put 200, right? So I prefer to use your license capacity. You could, maybe it's not logical, but you could change age groups or you could put walls somewhere else, but your building has the capacity for what on its license? Mm -hmm. We want to multiply that by, and typically if you serve an infant through after school community, your three-year-old rate is sort of an average. So your weekly or monthly three-year-old rate. Mm -hmm. If you don't serve one or the other of those, let us work, work with you to figure out what your average rate is. <coughs> if it's a weekly rate, mm -hmm. we want to convert that to an annual number. So we multiply by 52 weeks. If it's a monthly rate, it's 12 months. And then we multiply by 0.7. Okay, now what this says logically is if every slot in the school was filled with a full-time three-year-old, your average rate, here's how much money we could make. The reason I like this better than some other methods is it takes into account things like discounting, which is, uh, I get preachy about also, can get you in trouble with too much discounting. I think we have a um, master class on, on our uh, website for that. If not, ask us and we'll direct you to it because that is a huge factor in financial health and something that really sneaks up on people. But what this says is if every, if your, if your building was 70% full, a full-time three-year-old is your average rate, here's how much you would make on your top line, your base line. Then what we want to do is figure out how much of that should be paid in rent. Again, think 12 to 15 as your average with 8 and 18 on the sides if you're an older building or you're in a very high market. Generally, 15, 16% if you're brand new, nice real estate, otherwise market to about 12. And again, if you need specifics <coughs> or want an opinion of what number you should use, let me know. But if you get into the 20 to 30%, it's really hard to be financially healthy in this industry. Um, and too low, probably your real estate's not at the level you need it to be to run a, a very high quality program. And then we're gonna take that rent number, divide it by the return that the investor wants, the capitalization rate to get the value of the building. All right, example. Okay, so we went through the calculation. We took the three-year-old tuition rate and the license capacity we multiplied that by 52 weeks and 70%. And that said that if we were 70% full in our hypothetical building, we would earn a million dollars on the top line. Now that we know we need to earn a million dollars to be financially healthy, and every dollar we earn over that practically goes to the bottom line, but we want to set our benchmark at 70%. 
And this is a newer building and it's in a nice market and it competes with high end childcare services in the area. Mm -hmm. So we believe that it can afford a rent of 15% of the gross revenue. So 15% of a million dollars is $150,000. And when I say rent, I don't mean property taxes. I don't mean utilities. I don't mean repairs and maintenance. I mean, base rent and do include CAM, common area maintenance charges in that. So if you have a lease or you have to pay in your building, common area, uh, lawn care or pest control. Um, if you don't know what that is, just look up CAM charges. If you don't know what it is, you probably don't have it and don't need to worry about it. But just raw rent would be $150,000 in this case. So we believe that the business sitting in this building can afford to pay to the new real estate investor $150,000 a year in rent. This investor wants to earn an 8% return on his investment. And he has said to us, I will buy your building. I will lease it back to you. You can use that money to grow. You can go um, do something fun, buy a new car, whatever is fun for you and take the money off the table, but I want an 8% return on my money. And I know that you can pay me $150,000 a year in rent. So if I take the $150,000 and I divide it by the expected return, so 8% is 0 0.08. So 150,000 divided by 0 0.08 is $1,875,000. So in this case, the business can earn a million dollars a year when it's 70% full. It's in a really nice building, so we believe it can afford to pay rent of 15% or $150,000 a year. We um, have found an investor that is willing to buy the building and feels good about you as a tenant and will lease it back to you. Um, and they want an 8% return on their money. And so we take the $150,000, we divide it by the expected return of 0 0.08, and that investor can pay you $1,875,000 and get an 8% return by receiving $150,000 a year in rent. That's how it works. Okay. <coughs> We have about 20 minutes for questions. We already have some in here, so good. I don't know if that means um, I didn't explain well, or you guys are just really curious. Okay, let's see what we have. Um, um, <coughs> should I buy the real estate I lease? Okay, really good question. Well, so we've done a lot of, We've done a lot of content on lease or buy. And in our opinion, it's just, <coughs> it's just a resource question. <coughs> so you guys heard me say that I'm a big fan of real estate ownership. I believe that over time, um, there are fluctuations in real estate, but I don't think it goes this way. I think over time it creeps up. And it's something you can wrap your head around and understand. What I like about real estate ownership is that if you own real estate in, in our industry and eventually you sell the business and keep the real estate, if something were to happen with the operator in your building, I feel like you would know what to do with it. If you decided to buy a body shop building and lease it to somebody. I don't know that you know how to do auto body work. So I like sticking with what you know, but to me, whether you buy or you lease is just a resource question. Can you use those resources more effectively to grow your business? Can, um, do you have enough resource from your cash flow to continue to invest in real estate? I'm a, I'm, a big, um, I'm a big believer in growth, 
you guys know how hard it is to get people right now and growth for a lot of reasons. One reason is it helps you afford people resources. <clears throat> um, another reason is I saw a question come in and, and I lost my train of thought. Um, another reason is that if you have a very high quality team, they'll almost force you to grow to create new opportunity for them. So I'm a growth person and I believe to keep growing. And if you need resource to do that, then lease real estate. If you have enough resource, own your real estate. Okay. <clears throat> what if you're, I'm so glad you asked this, Rebecca. Thank you. I should have said this already. What if your real estate is worth much more than your calculation accounts for? Okay, so this is a thing, and um, thank you for bringing it up. Often, two, one of two things happens. And the one that's good is that perhaps the underlying real estate, if it was empty, is not worth what it's worth with the business in it. So let's go in that direction first, because that's easier, but I'll get to your question. Often we can, if we're working with clients and there's a thriving business in it, we can get them more money for their real estate than it would ever be worth as an empty building. Um, because the business can afford to pay more rent, the investor gets more return. You guys got the theory. Very often in today's market, and this typically happens in pretty high income markets, the real estate is worth more as just raw real estate than the business can pay in rent currently. I would really like to look at those metrics with people if they're in that situation. There have been times where we've said to people, we really think, can you move your business into another building? Because occasionally crazy things happen and an investor wants a, a building so badly for something else that they're willing to pay a lot more for it than the business in it can afford for him to pay for it. So it does happen that the value of the real estate outpaces what the business can afford to pay in rent. Um, and I think that in those cases, we really worked with clients to either reposition a business and sell that piece of real estate to somebody else if that was what they wanted to do, or if they were gonna stay in the um, building and continue to operate, we would work with them to try to improve the financial situation of the business to get it to where it matches up with the actual value of the real estate. But those things don't, those two outliers don't happen all that often. And like I said, the lower end's easier to deal with because in this market, we can get overvalue at times for real estate if the business is thriving. It's really difficult to get an investor um, or, to, or for the business to afford to pay the rent that would be required to support what that real estate's worth. So I hope that makes sense to you, Rebecca, but thank you for asking that question because it's really important. Um, so our school districts are adding full, hey Jennifer, all right, school districts are adding full day tuition based on pre-K programs as of this year. Is this impacting other cities? and or future sales with public schools offering these programs. Um, so yeah, so this is broader than a real estate question, but a good one. <coughs> I, had the, uh, I had the pleasure of writing this year's Child Care Information Exchange's top 50 article that's coming out in January and February. And you guys probably know the list in the magazine, along with a new list of who are the largest top 50 companies in the country. Those, com those companies weighed in on their biggest issues. And, and for years now, we've had issues around staffing and how we continue to grow and hire and keep high quality staff. And we always get questions around public pre-K or universal pre-K. But this year was even more than usual. So at our conference, we have added a panel 
of um, three pretty high players <clears throat> in public policy that represent the early education community. And they are going to give some resources to our guests to combat this on their local level. So there are things that can be done statewide and, and nationally, but really those decisions are made on a local level and you guys really have to be proactive about being able to participate when it happens. So it's perceived as a big threat. Mm -hmm. It has actually happened in a lot of places, but it's very pocket oriented. But when it does happen, it can be devastating to a company. So your best defense is to be able to participate in the program and offer that program in your building. So um, I don't think this impacts the value of your real estate in any way other than keeping your building full. So your building needs to be financially healthy, maintain 70% or above occupancy. And if competition comes in, it could be universal pre-K, it could be the public school, it could be a new franchise that opened down the street, it could be um, the Parks and Rec or the YMCA, whoever it is, you have to stay at the top of your game and compete on your quality and participate if there's unfair dollars out there. By unfair dollars, I mean you can't compete with free if it's really good in most markets. You just have to be able to participate. So it's critical for you to hold your occupancy to hold the value of your real estate unless you close your business and sell it for raw um, real estate investment. Um, but it is something we're talking a lot about, Jennifer. I hope that you will be um, with us in Miami and, um, and get the benefit of that panel and let us know what you think about that. Hey, Tom, just to clarify, do or do not include the property taxes in the rent number. I mentioned CAM building you have has the property tax included in the cam um you include property taxes in the rent you charge yourself okay so for the my calculations include rent and cam do not include property taxes or maintenance or insurance so um you can you know the technical way you work that out is fine there are a lot of people that pay their landlord the rent and the property taxes and the cam and and maybe even part of the insurance. But for the benefit of our calculations, I want just rent and just camp. Thank you for asking that again, Tom. Um, <coughs> great question again here. Um, oh, where'd it go? There it is. is there a difference in the real estate and commercially zoned versus residential in terms of the real estate value? Um, so yes, there is. Um, so I mentioned many different factors that get, play into both the percent of rent that can be paid and the cap rate that an investor wants. So in general, an investor wants a commercial property and is willing to take a lower um, rate of return for a commercial property and would want a higher rate of return for a residential property. And logically, it's because they wanna be able to do something else with it if the childcare is no longer in it. So they generally will want a commercially zoned property, property and find that more valuable and less risky. So it played both into the rent and the cap rate, making the property more valuable if it's a commercial property. Another great question. Um, doesn't mean that if you know you say that your your um, properties are residentially zoned, but they're in very high end areas. So if you have a thriving business and somebody was going to come in and buy that and enter into a long term lease with you, an institutional investor would probably still consider that property if they got a thriving business and a secure tenant. So it's not like you couldn't do it, but the preference is commercially zoned properties. More important for your um, business to thrive, but it would be a factor. I wouldn't say it'd be a major factor, but it would be a factor. Um, 
I saw a raised hand. So if I don't know how to maybe type your question in for me. <clears throat> if I own the building in the school and I intend to sell soon, should I change the rent that I pay myself to make an impact on the sale, either raising or lowering the rent? Thank you, great question. So the answer is no, not necessarily. So you guys heard me say that um, generally you would, if you own your real estate, most people would hold their real estate in a second entity and pay themselves rent. You can pay yourself zero rent, or you can pay yourself every penny that the school makes, mm -hmm. and it would not impact the value of your real estate during a sales process because the hinge team or whoever you work with is going to reset that and adjust it for a market rent and a market value. The only um, decision making there is where your tax advantage. So work with your CPA and make the decision about how much you rent, rent you pay to yourself and what entity and how should I do that to be in the best tax situation. But that doesn't impact your value of your business or your real estate at all. So there's a good bit. Um, last masterclass, I did the value of your business. And if you guys go back to that one, what you'll see is there are several very common adjustments that are made from the raw numbers that you guys might give us until the numbers that we present to um, a potential buyer. So another question we get a lot is, I spent a lot of money this year on renovations. I, um, I added on to the building. I re-equipped a new classroom. So if your expenses are ongoing maintenance or supplies, then obviously they stay in the mix. If you did something unusual that was a capital project that increased the value of your real estate, that gets removed from the expenses. So it makes your business value go up. The other thing we get asked a lot is, should I stop doing personal expenses in the business? No, you can do that as long as you can substantiate those personal expenses and show proof that they were separate expenses. Very common to pay yourself a salary, pay your benefits, your phone, your car. Um, so it's very common to do those things and they just get removed from the number so that the underlying business value and potential is shown. And then that parlays into the underlying real estate value. Good question. One more in here. A couple more. Okay. Um, okay. Do you ever have programs that sell their business but stay on as an employee for a time period to help with the transition? So, um, Occasionally, but not generally. So let me speak to that from both an individual buyer and an institutional or larger buyer. If you sell to an individual that's inexperienced, they will probably want you to stay on for a while and you might want to do that to be sure that the transition happens well. If it's a larger company, it's a little bit rare for the owner to stay on as an employee, but it's not unheard of. We have done that um, just in the last year for some people that took some actually kind of cool jobs in companies where they might have been the school operator, but now they work for a larger organization that bought the business and one of them manages their acquisitions now. Um, it's not unheard of for that person to stay on as the director, but it is unusual mainly because the sellers checked out, you know, they didn't sell not to still stay there, so they want to be out. Um, also, <coughs> in a perfect world, you backing out of your business almost doesn't get noticed. So you want to build your team to the place that when you sell your business, the relationships are between your people, your directors and the teachers and your directors and the parents, and you leaving does not cause a big problem. In that case, most buyers would want at the closing it's, it's generally considered healthiest if you are not there. It's healthier for you for one thing, but also it just forces the employees and parents to begin to build a relationship with the new owner. So it's not unheard of, but it is in our world, it's a little unusual. 
<laughs> Would an owner with multiple schools expect a different cap rate or valuation of selling a basket of properties instead of just one? So while if you are selling businesses, the number of schools that you have greatly affects the value that you get. And the biggest leap is from one to two schools. And then there's several other benchmarks, but the more schools you have definitely increases the value of them all. So maybe at one school, you're gonna get a four multiple for your business. At 20 schools, you're gonna get a nine multiple. So that first one that had a four over here is now a nine along with the other 19, a big difference. If you have multiple pieces of real estate, it does not greatly affect the cap rate or the valuation. It might tweak it a bit. We can probably push the envelope a little bit more, um, but it does not greatly affect it. So let's say it would go from seven and three, three quarters to seven and a half, maybe a quarter point, but it isn't gonna go from seven to five or you know, drastic differences because that investor still wants the same level of return. And again, they're more interested in your ability to pay the rent and your financial strength than the underlying real estate because they want the return on their money. That's how they're thinking. Good question. Okay, <clears throat> one more. What are some strategies to maintain business operations while performing a major rehab or addition to the building? particularly for programs that have subsidy payments that are dependent on the business being open in order to receive any reimbursement. We just had that conversation in, in house yesterday around a client who is actually selling her company. She's got a couple of schools and the buyer wants to do some major renovations. And we all know that if the business was shut down, parents are not gonna be there when you reopen three months later or even a couple of weeks later, some might come back. But in general, people who need care are gonna go find care somewhere else. So some things that I've seen that have worked are if you have capacity in your building, you work around the spaces and you do spaces at a time. So you move children into certain spaces, you renovate other spaces. In this case, we need to renovate a kitchen Maybe an idea is to cater the food in for a couple of months and not have to be creative with the kitchen. Maybe parents would be willing to bring lunch for three months and you have juice and snacks. So there's some options there. If you have another building in the area, maybe you can incentivize parents for a couple of months to go to another building Maybe you can lease a church space offsite for let's say you're after schoolers for a couple of months, do transportation back and forth to make it easy for parents to pick up. So those are, it is difficult at times, do what you're talking about doing, but those are some creative ways that we've seen that work. We are out of time, but you guys had fantastic questions. Um, we do have a couple more and I don't like to leave any questions hanging. So we will get you answers to your questions. Um, thank you for hanging in there with me for a concept that's not, it's, it's foreign. So it's a different way of thinking about your real estate as it relates to your business. Um, again, my hope is that you came away from this with some new theories, maybe some ideas about how to build your real estate assets and use them wisely, and some terminology that you might hear again as you grow reach out to the team if we can help you specifically with your individual situation. We hope to see you guys in February in Miami. At least it will be warm and I know where some of you are and it's not warm where you are. Take care. <laughs>